Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Ipoo University on the Dice Tower. Today, we'll be teaching you how to play Cult of the Deep, a game designed by Sam Stockton and published by BA Games. We are using a prototype copy of the game, and so the rules and components may not be final. Let's get to the table. Cult of the Deep is a hidden role game set around a cult which is based in the fictional world of Stavros, Greece. The cult is led by the High Priest, and some players will be faithful to that High Priest, while there will be various Kabbalists plotting against the High Priest. Players will roll dice, attempting to heal themselves, battle each other, and summon creatures in a series of rituals. At the end of the game, whichever player or team meets its win condition, which usually involves wiping out its enemies, will win the game. To set up the normal 5 to 8 player mode of the game, you'll first need to set up the deck of greenbacked roll cards. At 5 players, you'll use the High Priest, a Faithful, 2 Cabalists, and a Vengeful Heretic. At 6 players, you'll have 3 Cabalists and the Repentant Heretic. At 7, you'll have 2 Faithful and the Vengeful Heretic. And at 8 players, you'll have 4 Cabalists and the Repentant Heretic. We'll explain the different setup for the 4 player mode later in the video. You will also shuffle the red-backed character cards and the purple-backed sigil cards. If this is your first game, you should leave the necromancer character out of the deck. Deal each player one card of each type. The character card is flipped face up, and for the high priest only, the roll card is flipped face up. All other players must leave their roll card face down. Take health markers equal to your character's health, and the High Priest will gain some extra life points based on how many Kabbalists are in the game. Then shuffle the blue-backed Ritual cards and lay out three altar boards in a 5 or 6 player game, or four in a 7 or 8 player game. Flip a Ritual card face up onto each of the altar boards, and then place a red Ritual marker on your player count on any row showing an icon on these boards. So here it would be in these six positions. Set all the other coins and markers off to the side for now. These all relate to specific rituals and will come into play with that ritual. Give five of the blue cultist dice to the high priest who will play first, and you're ready to play. Cult of the Deep is a hidden role game in which your primary aim is to kill your enemies. Do be warned though that death is not the end, and a player who has died can continue to help their allies from the grave. A player's win condition may also change upon death. I'll go through all of the different win conditions now. The High Priest and Faithful have the simplest win conditions. They must keep the High Priest alive, and kill all of the heretics and Kabbalists. The Faithful can win the game under this condition whether they are alive or dead, but the High Priest must stay alive for any of those players to win. The basic win condition for the Kabbalists is to kill the High Priest, and if at least one Kabbalist remains alive and the High Priest is dead, then all Kabbalists, dead or alive, win the game. The basic win condition for the Heretic roles is to be the last cultist left alive or to have all cultists dead. Although the game comes with two different types of heretic, there will only ever be one at your player count, and the basic win condition is the same for both. Once a heretic has died, its win condition shifts to match one of the other teams. The repentant heretic will win alongside the high priest and faithful, and the vengeful heretic will win alongside the Kabbalists. This gives the heretic players a win condition to target once they've been killed. The Kabbalists can also change win conditions, but not until all Kabbalists have died. Once this happens, the Kabbalists will win alongside the heretic. So now let's look at how a turn plays. Cult of the Deep is played in turns, starting from the High Priest and then going clockwise around the table until a win condition has been triggered. Each turn involves rolling dice and then assigning the icons on those dice to different actions, but the turn, strictly speaking, is split into four phases. The roll phase, the commit phase, the response phase, and the resolve phase. Many of the special powers in the game occur during one of those specific phases, and the order is important, so you must respect this sequence. 
The first phase is the roll phase, in which the active player performs a Yahtzee roll with five of the cultist dice. This means you roll all dice, and then may re-roll any number of dice up to a total of twice. Second comes the commit phase, where the active player must assign or commit each of the five dice rolled to a cultist or a ritual. This is done by simply placing the die onto that cultist or that ritual. You may commit dice to yourself or to other cultists. The only two restrictions are when committing to a ritual, the ritual must show that icon and its marker must be above zero. So here you could commit a parchment, but not a cosmos or an ancient. And to commit a die to a cultist that matches its power icon, which is different for each character and is shown in the top right corner, this may only be done by the active player committing that die to themselves. So here, if it were the guardian's turn, this commitment would be allowed but this one is not. There is no limit to the number of dice which may be committed to one place in a single phase. Next is the response phase, and this is an opportunity for all players at the table to play any response phase actions that they wish to play. This could be effects from character cards, from spending siren coins, and so on. There is no turn order. Players simply take any actions they wish to take. Some response phase effects result in changing the face currently showing on a die. When this happens, the active player is given a once-off opportunity to recommit that die to another place. Similarly, if the active player gains a new die as a result of a response effect, then it must be committed immediately. The phase ends once nobody wishes to play any response effects anymore, and if no one plays any response effects, then nothing happens in this phase. Finally comes the resolve phase, in which each die face is resolved. For each blood icon, or each icon matching that character's power icon, the character gains one life. Life can be gained above the starting life value. For each single or double dagger assigned to a cultist, that cultist loses one or two lives respectively. Other icons have no effect on cultists unless they have a special power which grants an effect. For each matching symbol on a ritual, reduce the ritual marker by one and then gain the effect printed next to the word altar. Here, for example, it would be to gain a siren coin. When all tracks on a ritual reach zero, one of two things could happen. Either the card could tell you to discard it, in which case you would replace it with the top card from the ritual deck and reset the marker to your play account, or if the ritual has a keeper effect, then you will take that card into your collection, giving you a permanent ongoing bonus. Then refill the altar as usual. Additionally, during the resolve phase, some players will have resolve phase powers on their character cards or other effects, and these get resolved during this phase. Once all of those effects are played and all dice have been resolved, the dice are gathered up and given to the next player clockwise for their roll phase. There are several other effects which can help the cultists in the game. Each cultist begins the game with a face down sigil card, which is a once off effect which can be discarded and resolved, giving a powerful swing if played at the right time. And through the effects of different rituals, players may gain chant coins, Siren Coins or Kraken Dice. Chant Coins are spent during your own commit phase to change any die face to any other except Double Dagger. And one Siren Coin may be spent on another player's response phase to recommit one of their dice to a different cultist or ritual. With the Kraken Dice, you will gain these as long as the Kraken Ritual is in play, and at the start of your turn, before the roll phase, you must roll them and lose the amount of health showing on the dice, here 7. Alternatively, you may re-roll each die, but each time you do, you lose one of your dice from the subsequent roll phase. Kraken dice are not removed until the Kraken itself is completely out of play, both off the altars and out of a player's hand. Alternatively, they can also be removed from a player by the Keeper effect of the Kraken card. When you have lost your last health, and it is the end of a phase of someone's turn, you have been killed. 
you will reveal your roll card to the rest of the table, and if you had any keeper effects on rituals, you give the card to the player who killed you. If you were killed by your own hand or by a neutral component such as a Kraken, then the card is discarded. Then choose one of the black Wraith cards and place it on top of your character card. The Wraith ability now replaces your character ability for the rest of the game. Then immediately gain three of the red Wraith dice, which are set to the faces shown on your Wraith card. Do note that the Wraith dice and the Cultist dice have the same anatomy, but you use the different colours to tell them apart during the game. Your turn as an active Wraith player still has the normal four phases, including a roll phase where you'll roll and re-roll the three dice that you now have, as well as commit, response and resolve phases. However, the key difference is that you are not allowed to commit your dice during the commit phase. You will hold your dice over until the end of the turn and can use them on other players' turns. Each Wraith has a different response phase ability which can be used once per other player's turn and this will be the way that you can commit or move your dice into play to be resolved, helping your team from beyond the grave. The icons on your card are the ones you'll be able to assign between your death and your first roll phase. The game will end immediately when a win condition is met, which will be either when the High Priest is dead, or when all Cabalists and the Heretic are dead. Each player then checks their current win condition, and the players who meet their win conditions win the game. Once you're more familiar with the game, you can play with the Advanced Necromancer character. Unlike all the other characters in the game, the Necromancer's ability does not occur when alive, but instead is retained and used only when the player is dead. The Necromancer will gain coins when the Ancient Symbol is rolled, and when gaining enough coins, can bring themselves back to life. You can set up with the Necromancer in two ways, either by dealing the card out randomly as usual, or giving it directly to the High Priest. If you take this option in an 8 player game, switch out the Repentant Heretic with a Vengeful one. The end game conditions also change in that now the Kabbalist must defeat the High Priest and any Faithful in order to win the game. This gives the High Priest the opportunity to die and then use the Necromancer ability to come back to life. The game also plays in a 4 player variant, with the players taking the roles of the Faithful, two Kabbalists and a Repentant Heretic. The High Priest is played by a game AI. The High Priest has a character but no sigil card and rolls 6 dice each turn instead of 5. After rolling, the High Priest re-rolls only those dice which can't legally be placed. If the High Priest's health exceeds 15 life points, then any dice will be committed in the following priority. First, assigning weapon dice to attack the other cultists, then assigning dice to the rituals, and then finally assigning any healing or power symbols to heal the High Priest. When assigning the dagger dice, start with the two daggers and then the one dagger, and always assign to the cultist who currently has the most health, minus any for any daggers already committed. So here, the first double dagger would be assigned to this cultist with 12 health. The second would now be assigned to this cultist, because it has 11 versus 12 minus 2 is 10. And then the third single dagger is assigned here. Because where there is a tie, here they would each have 10 life left, it is assigned clockwise from the High Priest's position. As this occurs during the commit phase, the players will still have the opportunity to reassign these dice during the response phase, but this is the sequence you have to go through in the commit phase to work out where the dice are placed. Once the High Priest's health is below 15, they will start to prioritise healing ahead of attacking or rituals. The first time either the Faithful or the Repentant Heretic is killed, that player then takes on the role of the High Priest for the rest of the game. That player leaves behind their old win condition and character, but brings along any sigil card or leftover coins. As High Priest they will still roll 6 dice instead of 5, and the dead character does not become a Wraith as in the higher player count games. And that's how to play Cult of the Deep. We hope you enjoyed this video.
when we film this video, Cult of the Deep is going to Kickstarter. So we'll put the link in the description below when it is live so you can check it out. If you enjoy this video or find it somewhat useful, please help us by hitting that like button and subscribe to the Dice Tower if you haven't already done so. And if you have any questions, comments or feedback, please leave them in the comment section below. See you in our next videos. Bye.